everyone, welcome back. Well, we're in chapter 16 and we are about to finish up this textbook, so let's get right to it. So today we're talking about columns, but not just specifically about columns, but about how stability works for a column and what in the world is buckling load or buckling stress for a column. So let's get right into it. Now you might have seen columns like these if you've ever visited Greece or some other ancient site. And the big thing is, from what we've learned so far, we could look up what the um, failure, fest, uh, sorry, goodness, failure stress is for any of these columns and say, okay, that's where it's going to fail. But the issue is that it will typically fail before that. So columns, they're being pushed in this direction, and that's great. However, under too great a load, it's not going to be nice and straight anymore. It's going to bend, and as soon as it starts bending, it's going to fail. So that's what we're trying to figure out here. So let's see if we can figure this out. So here I have a column. At the top, it's allowed to move up and down if it wants to, but it can't move side to side. And then I'm saying, okay, my column, tell me out here, I'm gonna add that spring in the middle. Now, why do I do that? Well, this is our elementary buckling model. I have this because I need some way of figuring out what happens if my column ever moves to the side, if my column ever moves slightly to the side. Now, if it was a perfect beam, it would never deform. But as soon as I add in a slight change here, as a note, this is greatly exaggerated because I am having to show you what's going on here. As soon as I add a slight bend into my column, things go crazy. And as a note, no matter how perfect your column is, there is a slight bend in it at some point. Now, what you might realize is that if this column is not going to completely fail, that spring right there is going to have to resist the moment being caused by these two forces pushing on it. Because there's a force and there's a distance. And if I have a force times a distance, I've got a moment. So if that spring can resist that, we're good. If it can't, it's going to be continue to bend and eventually fail. So if we look at this, what we can find is, okay, if we have this spring stiffness of K, and I look at the angle delta theta, I can say that my moment that I'm having to resist is going to be um, equal to the spring stiffness times twice the change in the angle from the horizontal. So this is the moment that's just caused by my spring. And then I have another moment which is being caused by these two forces. As a note, those two forces, they are a um, couple moment. That's why I have this distance right here between the two of them, which is L over two sine of theta. And I don't have to take into account both of them because I'm doing it as a couple moment where I only count one of the forces, but the distance between both rather than two of the forces and half the distance between the both. It comes up the same either way. But with this, I can look at this and say, okay, if I'm looking for this dangerous load where this spring, remember this spring is, you know, you don't have a column that's really made with springs. I'm just using this as an example here. Um, I can then solve to figure out where my critical load is. And since we're going to assume that all these angles are very, very small, that term right there is going to be around zero. Okay, It's going to be almost zero. Not 100%, but very, very close. So when we solve for it, what we get is we get 4k over L. 4 times this stiffness right here over the length. So the first thing we should notice here is that the longer my beam is, the longer my beam is, the smaller my critical load is. And that's an important factor. If you have a very, very tall beam, it's going to have a very, very low critical load, which is why you have to have some sort of support along that beam. Okay, now, I've been talking about stability for these columns. What do I mean by stability? Well. It's often a little bit difficult to grasp, but let's go ahead and look at some pictures here. And we'll keep on going through it. So first, at the top, I have um, dynamic stability. So dynamic stability simply means if I offset the ball, it will come right back. That's great. I want that. Now, in the second, uh, in the bottom case, I have what's called static stability. It simply means if I move the ball, it's not going to go back, but it's going to stay wherever I move it to so long as I don't apply a force you know, accelerating it. And then I finally have something that's completely unstable, 
It's statically stable because if I don't touch it, it's going to stay there. But it's dynamically unstable, so if I move it, it's going to keep on moving right here. So this is the issue I'm worried about for my column. If I get past a certain load, past that critical load, I go to, from being stable to being unstable, and it will continue to bend and bend and bend until it breaks. As long as I'm less than that load, though, as soon as I remove that load, it'll bounce back. Everything's fine. But above that load, it cannot take it. Okay, so now that we've gone through this, we've understand a little bit about how buckling is going to happen because eventually our material can't resist that moment caused by a slight offset. We also looked and we learned about what stability was. So now let's actually look at a more realistic example, a pin ended column. You're like, columns aren't connected with pins. For the case of what we're doing, even a bolted, well, or a bolted column will act like it has a pin connection because it has just enough give, they can bend slightly and then it can fail. So, now at the critical load, if I reach this perfect critical load and I just stay there, okay, I don't add any more, any deflection of the beam would still be in equilibrium for very, very small deflection, which simply means that if I have this load, technically I could push this guy out here anywhere I want and it would stay stable. Now, once again, that is for very, very small deflections. But once I get more than that, it is not going to be stable anymore. It is going to begin to fail incredibly. And we don't want that to happen. So if I take the bending moment inside of my beam, and I look at the moment that's being caused by this slight deflection and my force I'm applying, I can go ahead and put an equilibrium. And so from our equation so far, we know what our bending moment is in terms of deflection. And we know we can get that as the second derivative of our deflection with respect to x times our moment inertia and times the modulus elasticity. We can begin to develop an equation to help us figure out what this critical load is going to be. So if I solve this, and as a note, this has a set solution. Thank a mathematician. We don't have to do it ourselves. What I'll get is this value right here. This is for an ideal pin ended column. And you notice there's n right here, and it's one, two, three. So there's actually several different states that this could be in. Now, what do I mean by these several different states? Well, let's look at it. So the first bending mode you would see is this. This is the one where it's honestly going to fail. Like it's not going to fail the other ones unless you have some sort of support. However, if I were to have added some support right here, such that it couldn't fail the first one, I would reach the second failure mode, which is when I have n equal to 2. And if I had even more support, it's why I could reach the third um, failure mode. Now what's cool about this is if you've ever looked inside of a wall, inside of your house, you'll see the studs going up and down. And those studs are acting as columns. And honestly, they're very long columns. So in order to increase the failure load, they put a support in the middle of those columns. That support means it increases the critical load by a factor of four by having that there. And if they added more, it would increase even more. Like you can greatly increase the strength of your wall just by adding a little piece of wood in the middle to support it. So if you're thinking about this, like you will never see for a column by itself, the second or the third or the fourth failure mode. It'll only ever be the first one, but you can add supports to make it so you can see the other ones as well. Okay, so now we have this critical load right here, but now we want to go ahead and normalize this. So we have our critical load, let's divide it by an area and get our critical stress. Nothing too crazy here. And with that, I can simplify that even more. So why did I bring this idea of R in here? This is what's called the slenderness ratio, okay? This is the slenderness ratio. My slenderness ratio is simply equal to my moment inertia over the air. Sorry, oh, goodness. L over R is my slenderness ratio. And that R is coming from being equal to my moment inertia over my area times the square root. 
So it went too far right there. So the more slender my column is, as in its length versus its area, um, the smaller my critical stress will be. So think about it this way. If I have a fat column and I have a thin column, you have a good idea that the fat column is going to fail a lot later than the thin column. You just kind of intrinsically know that. And so this term right here is bringing that into it, giving us that idea. Okay. And so here's the values of slenderness ratio. It's right here on the bottom of this column. And you can see what happens for all of these as I get to longer and longer values. Now, interestingly enough, buckling is an elastic phenomenon. It actually doesn't fail um, because of plastic deformation. I mean, it will plastically deform as it's failing. Like, you know, when you start bending like this, it's going to eventually snap. But to start, when it begins failing, it's all an elastic phenomenon. So it will only happen if the critical stress is below the proportional limit. So right here, and right here, this is for steel and blue and aluminum for red. I can see the critical stress for those two. Sorry, the, um, the yield stress for those two. That's where I go from elastic to plastic deformation. And for slenderness ratios for uh, below 42 for aluminum or below 89 for steel, I will not see buckling. It will fail in a different mode first. But once I get above that, you can see that I begin to have this sudden drop in the amount of stress that it can take because it's going to fail through buckling stress. And as I keep on going further and further, you can see that it drops down dramatically. You do not want to have a very slender column. It's not good for you. Okay, that being said, let's work an example, and I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.